Welcome back to Home Improvement Woodworking. Today I'm going to show you how to replace door trim on a pre-hung door. I'm going to make this door trim look like what I've got here in the closet. This is part of a bedroom remodeling project. In a previous episode, I replaced the sliding doors by framing in the opening and installing doors on hinges. I've also built in this organizer to make the most use of the closet space. Then I installed the casing on the closet with a decorative cap. Our upcoming plans include building in some cabinets and a window seat. Replacing trim on a door might seem fairly straightforward, but on a pre-hung door, the door is built with the trim on it. It's stood up in place and that trim is used to secure it. So when I take that off, this door is going to want to move. Stay tuned, I'll show you how it's done. Our video show you how to add value and character to your home. This is the centerpiece of the room, so it really needs to visually work. Learn how to get quality results that you'll be proud of. Welcome to Home Improvement Woodworking. The first step to remove the trim is to cut along the outside of the trim between the trim and the drywall. And what that does is it separates the two so when you start taking off the trim, you won't be peeling back the drywall. The key is to use a sharp knife. I use a utility knife, a good quality one. They only cost about $20, but they'll make your life much easier than using a cheap one. At the bottom here, I need to take the baseboard off and I'll show you why. This is the plinth block. This is the bottom of the casing. The casing will go here and the baseboard is going to go here. So I've got a larger baseboard, larger casing. So I'm going to take this off while I'm here. It'll just get out of the way. Now that I've separated the casing from the drywall, what I need to do is separate the casing from the door jamb. This casing is typically glued on pre-hung doors, so it's going to be a battle to take it off. But if I score that line between the two of them, it's going to become a little bit easier. I can now take off the casing, but I want to make sure I do this in the right order. I'm going to take off the top first, and then I can see what's going on in there. But these sides are really important to prevent that door from moving around. So I'm going to save that as the next step. I'm going to use a putty knife to loosen it up, and if I need to, a small pry bar to help me pull those off. Now just a little safety tip for you, when you've got nails sticking out of trim like this, as you take these off, bend them in and get them out of the way. That way you're not going to accidentally put one of these on the floor and then end up stepping on it. We look between the door jamb here and the framing, there's nothing in there at all. There's one finishing nail here, another one here, and one down the end. So what I want to do is shim up these pieces here, because as soon as I take this casing off, there's nothing between here. So I want to lock in these top corners and then start taking the casing off as I progress down the door. I'm going to shim this at this corner and the other corner, and I've got some thick shims to do this because of the size of the opening. So I'm going to take the thick end of the shim, put it in first, and then the thinner end of this shim and put it in. And that means I've got a parallel shim in here. And I'm just going to jam that in place and drive a finishing nail through. And then this is secure. Cutting shims off is easy. Again, just make sure you've got a sharp utility knife. And what you do is score the back of it. And then you can bend it up snap it off. Now that I have two inch finishing nails in the top corner here, I know the door jam is not going to move there. So I'm going to move on to the casing on the hinge side first. I'm going to take it off, I'm going to shim it up, I'm going to put finishing nails in, and that way it's going to lock it in place. And then I can move over to this casing, take this off, and then I can move that door jam in and out to make sure I've got a nice even gap from the top to the bottom.
Behind the hinge here, there should be a shim, but with a pre-hung door, you don't end up with that. So the only thing that's holding this in place right now is the trim on the other side. So I need to shim up behind these hinges and make sure that they're not gonna move. Just to prove what I mean about how loose this is, I can just push this over and you can see the gap over there changing. So I need to make sure I'm shimming this in the right spot. Now the trim on the other side of this is holding it in place. So that casing is preventing it from rocking out this way. It's just vertically here. I need to make sure I get it in the right spot. Now this door had a consistent gap top to bottom. So rather than put a level on this, I'm just gonna use that side as my guide as to where to shim this out. The casing gets put on the door jam with glue and you can see these staples. So where these staples are, I try and work around them and try and get as much of the trim off as possible. And then where I'm stuck, I like to use my secret weapon fencing pliers. These are my great grandfathers and they come in handy for sections like this because you can grab that staple and just pull them out. With all the staples removed, I can now make sure this is nice and smooth and ready for the new casing. Where the drywall transition to the old casing, there's caulking, and the easiest way to take that off is with a paint scraper. Where I've got the door jam here, there are some parts that are glued on from the old casing. I use a sharp chisel to clean those off and get them nice and smooth. In a section like this where there's a fair bit of material that's still glued on there, it's much more efficient to use a plane. So if you have one, this is a small block plane. It's much easier to just plane this down. And it works much faster than trying to use a chisel and keep it at the right angle. We're now ready to install the casing and this casing has five components to it. The first one is a plinth block that goes at the bottom. The second is the casing that's here. And then the other three components are what happens here at the top. This is called a cap. Now, when I did this closet, this cap I built in place because I wanted a tight joint at the far end where it meets the wall. But on a door like this, you don't need to do that. You can build it in a controlled environment, a shop environment, and it's much easier to build. So I'm gonna build that in the workshop, but first we need to put the plinth block in and get the right length on the casing. The plinth block goes right here, and the purpose of a plinth block is to transition between the baseboard and the casing here. And this is the baseboard I'm putting on. You can see what a difference it is from the builder's grade baseboard that's here. So this will be going here once it's mitered in the corner. And then the casing goes on top. And what I need to do is line this up with the old paint line that's here to get the proper alignment. So I'll put the plinth block on first and then I can measure the length of the casing. I'm gonna use a finish nailer to put this in. This is a one inch block and I need enough to get through the half inch drywall. So I'm using two inch nails. So a finish nailer is good for that. And I use a brad nailer for the smaller trim work here. So I'll get this lined up. I don't wanna push it down on the carpet too much. I don't want it to uh, really compressed in there. So we'll get it lined up here on the paint line and put some nails in. Now we can stand the casing on top of that plinth block and we can mark our length. What I want to do is mark the length of this top paint line here on the casing, and that'll be the length I cut it to. Right there. The other measurement I want while I've got the casing up here is to line this up on the paint line and then mark the outside dimension here. 
that gives me the outside dimension of the cap. So I'm going to take this measurement and then I can build a cap in the workshop. I've cut this one by six to length, so it's now the right length of the cap. And the next part is to put on the moldings. The bottom molding is a half round, it goes here, and the top molding is a small crown, and it goes here. Now you can't just put these moldings on and cut them square, what you need to do is miter them at the corner and put on what's called a return. Here's a sample of a molding that's all one piece, it's a similar design, and here you can see on the end it's just got a molded profile. Now these are fairly expensive, but if you're doing something out of solid wood, it might be a good alternative for you because you get a nice consistent grain pattern on all three areas here. Now what I've done on this end is I've mitered a return. So if we look at the top, you can see the main board is mitered at a 45 and the smaller board is mitered at a 45. And what that does when you put them together is it gives you a nice profile on that edge. So this is called a return, this side here, and that's what we have to do on the ends of these pieces of trim. We have to put returns on and it gives you that nice decorative look. Building a cap like this is more efficient in a workshop environment because I've got all my tools at hand here. In the previous video I showed you how to build one in place and cutting that small return and getting it just the right size is difficult. I'll show you an easy way to do it here. I'll start with a half round and the first thing I want to do is cut a return. So I want a piece here with a miter this way. So we'll set this to 45 degrees, leave an excess amount here, it doesn't really matter how much, and then cut it to size. With that out of the way, I can now move this to 45 over here. And what I'm doing is putting a miter on the main piece that goes in the body. I can now take my return, hold it here, and you can see I can hold it in place and get a nice tight corner. Before I do anything else, I'm going to glue these together. I use a CA glue that's thick and an accelerator. CA glue is really best for this because in 10 seconds I can have a fixed joint. So it's just a matter of spraying on the accelerator on one half, applying the glue to the other half, and I'm just putting this on the miter itself. I'm not putting it anywhere else. So just move that around a little bit. The thick is what you want for doing work like this because it will absorb. So as soon as I put these together, I've got a few seconds to position them and then I'll have a permanent bond. So get this exactly where I want and then we're good to go. So there we go. We now have a joint. I just need to push this end in so I've got it exactly where I want and now I can mark this end. And the way I mark this is I do my mark here at the end, that's the distance I want at the smallest end, and then I put an angle this way. And that tells me when I cut my miter I'm going to cut it on this angle and it don't get mixed up with the saw. Now when I bring this to the saw I've already got a piece attached here but because this trim is so flexible I can just push it up against the fence and it's not an issue. To make an accurate cut like this, what I do is start wide and then work my way towards it to get precisely where I want. I've cut a small return piece as well so I can Put this on here and we'll check the fit. Yep, perfect. So now I'm ready to glue this on, but what I want to do first is I'm going to sand this board because I can get my random orbital sander over this very quickly, flatten it all out, get it ready for the finish. Before I glue that on, it's just a step that's going to save me some work. I'm going to glue this on with just traditional carpenter's glue, but I'm going to use the thick Starbond CA glue in just a couple strategic spots 
right down here at the end, one here in the middle, and then the other end down here. And what that'll do is act as my clamping. So I just marked it on the board here so I can keep my regular glue away from it. Just there. And there. And then the CA glue, what I'm going to do is, I'm not going to use the activator. I want this to go at its regular pace. And this is the thick and it will work for in about um, 30 to 60 seconds. So I'm going to put some here because I want that return to have a good grip because I'm going to be putting some pressure on it. Put some in the middle and some here on the end. So now the timer starts. I've got probably about 25 seconds left to line this up and get it where I want it. So I'll just use a regular clamp and clamp this in place. Do the same on this end. Okay, that's good. And then I'll just put one more in the middle here. Right in the middle to get that exactly where I want it. Okay, so the CA glue is going to act as the clamp. Give it about 60 seconds and that's good to go. In the meantime, what I can do is add the return on this end with the accelerator and the CA glue all at once. I'm gonna roll out some padding. I use this padding a fair bit on my other channel called Fixing Furniture. That's where I repair broken pieces of furniture like this and get them back in working order. So I can take these clamps off and put them away. And the trick that I've got here for trimming these is using a flush cutting saw. So, I just turn that upside down, pull out my flush cutting saw, and use the back as a reference. This is my Gokujo flush cut saw. It's a Japanese saw, which means it cuts on the pull stroke. And the key to using one of these successfully is making sure that you've got material behind when you're pulling. So if I were to cut this off this way, I could end up breaking off a piece when I go like this. So what I want to do is make sure as I'm cutting, I've got material that's supporting the piece I want to keep behind it. It's just a matter of laying it down flat and then cutting it off. And that's it, perfectly flush. So with the CA glue and that flush cutting trick, you can see how quick this is. The next step is to put the small crown on. It goes on like this. Now crown, oh, actually it's upside down. Crown goes on usually with a cove at the top. So it's going on like this. But to cut this on the miter saw, I need to turn it upside down so that I can get a 45 degree on it. I'm gonna start by getting rid of the waste on this end. So I'm gonna use this to cut a couple small returns, one for each end here. And then what I can do is size this piece in between those two and get it the size I need. The other thing about cutting crown molding is it's not perfectly square. It's a little bit less than 90 degrees. So you can see here, if I push it up against the fence, it's sitting up. If I push it down towards a table, it's a little bit off. So in a small crown like this, you don't need to be too accurate. I'm just gonna split the difference as I cut each of these parts.
Now if you're wondering what I'm doing back here, this is a dust collection system. This allows me to easily change the size of this. And I've got a dust collector that's pulling all the dust through. When I run this machine, I can actually sprinkle dust here and you can see it getting pulled in there. So it's a really effective solution. I've got plans for this on my website if you're interested. Now to line up my parts here, I just use a block here I've been using consistently when I build these to give me the distance I need. So I just line this up here, put three marks on, and now I know where my top crown needs to line up to. So I can hold this in place on this side, get the fit that I want, get it lined up on this side, on the line. Doesn't need to be dead accurate on that line, but reasonably close. So I've got the fit there that I want. I can now come over here, mark my line, and then cut this on the saw. So check for length here, line this up. It's exactly where I want it there. Let's see if this side lines up. Yep, perfect. So we're good to go. Okay, so I'm gonna do the same trick I did here. First, what I'm gonna do is glue on one return, and then I'll apply glue on the end and across here, and I can glue that other return on. The easiest way to glue this return on is to use a flat surface. And when I do this, I don't like using the accelerator on the CA glue. I just like using it straight because it gives me lots of time to position it exactly the way I want it. So there's no rush here, no stress, I just take my time. And that glue dries in about 60 seconds. So I don't have to be here a long time. So I just line them up on the flat surface make sure I've got everything lined up the way I want and I just need to hold it. Now, If you remember what I said the back of this isn't 90 degrees and it's important when you get to this end. So if I were just to glue this on flat what ends up happening here is this piece of trim isn't at 90 degrees. It actually needs to be kicked over a little bit. So I'll take my square and show you up close. So I'll put my square on the edge here and move this over you can see there's a bit of a difference there and I'll roll it square so the difference between that and that will be noticeable when it's up against the wall. So I'm going to use a combination of PVA glue and the CA glue. And what I'm doing is putting the traditional carpenter's glue on the back here and then what I'm using is the CA glue on the end and the CA glue is what's going to hold this square. So I'll get up my square here, line this up and then because the uh, PVA glue has an open time of about 15 minutes or so. This will allow me to get one end aligned with the CA glue and then I can go and do the other end while this glue is still wet and still setting. We'll let that end sit for a minute. Let's start at this end. And we'll use a flush cut saw to trim it off.
So there you go, the finished cap. Now the reason I like building this in my workshop versus building it in place is my saw is only seven feet away. So I've got all my tools handy here. Um, I'm in a workshop environment. It just makes it a very rapid process, especially with the CA glue. Oh, and there is a Starbond deal. If you use in the video description, the discount code, you'll get 10% off of Starbond CA glue. And what I'm gonna do next is sand this, just the, the profile, and then I'm gonna put a coat of primer on. And then what we'll do is take this back to the bedroom and install the casing. To sand the cap, I use 120 grit sandpaper. I just fold it in half. And the most important part to sand is the underside of this half round. This is most visible. And what you want to do is make sure there's a smooth transition between these pieces so that joint disappears. You can see here there's a difference in the level. Once the primer's on, you'll be able to see any flaws that you need to fix. So for example, I'll bring this a little bit closer. You can see there's a nice transition between the half round and the base here but here i've got a bit of an issue so that's just a small void it needs to get filled in and then reprimed and to do that i'll just use a wood filler So I've got the cap done here. I took advantage of having it off and I put the first coat of paint on it to give you a better idea of what this is going to look like. I still need to patch the holes after I put this on. So the steps are, this goes on last. What I'm gonna do is put on this side of the casing first and this is where it's going to be most visible. So this is where I'm going to line up the cap and then I'll get this side put on here and then I'll adjust that side so it meets the cap. It should be dead on, but if it's slightly off, I want it to be off on this side where it's not noticeable. I've taken the strike plate off this side to make room for the trim. I'll stand it up here at the bottom and start nailing it in at the top. I'm nailing this in with two inch finishing nails and what I need to do is make sure I get through the drywall and into the stud. So to the right of this spot right here is where the stud is. So I'll line this up, make sure I've got a nice tight joint at the bottom there, and then drive it in. On this side, I'll stand the casing up so it's touching both hinges. And I use a business card just to give me a little bit of space there so the hinge can operate properly. I'll put another nail midway up here. Now we can put the cap on top. And as I mentioned before, what I want to do is make sure I've got it lined up at this edge here. I'm lining up this with the casing here. So that's where I want it there. It's fitting well. So I need to drive a nail into the stud, which is in line here. So there's one. And then over here, I'll just leave a bit of space with the casing. And we're good to go. Now I'm switching over to the brad nailer. This shoots one and a quarter inch brad nails. And what I'm gonna do is lock the trim in here on both sides to the jam. I'll finish off by putting two more finishing nails on the cap and then I'll show you some close-up details. You can see we've got a nice tight miter here in the small crown and on the half round. Now this has only got one coat of paint. There still needs to be more paint on it, but I need to patch these holes first. But you can appreciate the detail here and on the corner there where that miter is. It's important to paint trim with semi-gloss paint because it accentuates those curves and really makes the character stand out. You can see down here the plinth block, we've got a nice tight joint. And where this baseboard's coming in here, it's at the right height as well. The baseboards, I'm gonna work on the next video so you can learn how to install baseboards, including how to deal with difficult angles like this one here, and a few other tips and tricks. 
All I have left now is to fill the nail holes and put on some paint. On this cap over here, I built it and primed it in place, which means I now have to sand it in this room, which is going to make a bit of a mess. That's another reason I like building these in the workshop environment, and I can control all that. My goal is to teach you how to be successful in your projects and inspire you to take on a project like this. I hope you're finding these videos helpful. If you'd like to subscribe to our channel, you can click over here and click on the bell icon to get notified every time we publish a video. And if you'd like to see the videos in this series before this one, you can check out the playlist in the video description. Until next time, enjoy your time in the workshop.